My name is Jim Zimbelman. I'm a geologist at the Air and Space Museum, but what I tell people is I'm a planetary geologist. Now, what does that mean? That means one planet isn't quite enough, that we use the geology that we understand here on Earth to try and understand how the other planets got to be. When I was in middle school, seventh, eighth grade, I began to get interested in space, and not surprisingly, that was during the Apollo run-up. That was Gemini and, and the early Apollo missions. That was in the news a lot, so I thought, gee, space sounds like an interesting thing to do. My seventh grade science teacher um, made me realize I liked science. And this was still broad enough that we covered biology and chemistry and all of these other things. But he just taught it in a way that made me realize, hey, I can do this. And uh, it, wa it wasn't that he made me a planetary scientist, but he made me realize I can like science. And, and that might actually be possible. At the same time, Apollo was bringing around the, the stories about the moon, and that hooked me on space. My current research, at least under a NASA grant, is related to looking at sand dunes on Mars. And in my particular case, we're using the ripple patterns on the sand dunes to infer how the wind blew across those sand dunes. I haven't found anything that will get me a Nobel Prize, but I'm learning a lot about Mars, a lot about the Earth, using Earth as, as an analog to understand Mars and other places as well. well. Mars has an atmosphere, but it's a lot thinner than ours, and Mars is further from the sun, so it's colder. So we look for cold, dry, typically desert kinds of environments. The, uh, one of the best analogs temperature-wise is the dry valleys in Antarctica. But getting to Antarctica is kind of tough, so that there are many other places, depending on people's interests, that uh, we will go because it is a physical analog in the geologic setting and uh, as much as possible try and uh, deal with the fact that Earth still has a denser atmosphere than Mars. The interest in Mars has really stemmed from sort of NASA's interest long-term, looking for life off of the Earth. That was and still is a major goal of, of many of the NASA projects. And Mars has always been high on everybody's list in that realm. Why? Because it is a planet half the size of the Earth, but it has an atmosphere, has geologic evidence of water in the past, water and an atmosphere of some sort are pretty fundamental to life as we understand it. So that for a long time, Mars has been one of the ultimate places to look for life off of the Earth. If we find evidence of life on Mars these days, most scientists think it is at the microbial single cell kind of level. And the next rover following Curiosity will have instruments designed specifically to look for if there was any possible life in the past in the rocks on Mars could we find evidence uh, of that. But multicellular life requires conditions that we had in abundance here on Earth. That may be more rare than we had appreciated. Mars has been the focus of a lot of NASA's efforts in the recent years, but there are many other important things going on. We've got an active spacecraft at um, the moon. We've got an active spacecraft orbiting an asteroid. We've got spacecraft at uh, Saturn that's been operating for a decade, one that will get to Pluto in just a week now. Um, so there's these robot emissaries are all over the solar system, giving us piles and piles of data that uh, just kind of pick what topic sounds of interest to you. And as a student, you'd be able to follow that these days. The teachers can do the best for our country and our world to not discourage students from science. That unfortunately was a lot of my contemporaries uh, in uh, grade school who had a teacher that was not primarily science interested, so the science didn't turn out to be interesting to the class. To me, that's, that's one of the main drawbacks is that we don't turn them off too soon and lose uh, a good scientist just because they thought, gee, that isn't cool when they were in third grade or whatever. Well, the young kids, the kids who are up to maybe sixth grade these days, they are growing up knowing that we have planets around other stars. That was not the case when I was a kid. That was not the case when I was in graduate school. It wasn't the case when I was a, a scientist doing my own research. It's only within the last 20 years, really, 
that this is common knowledge that not just one, but thousands of planets exist around other stars. I am having a ball trying to understand our solar system. We are one of thousands, maybe millions, who knows how many systems that have planets, all different, all gonna have their own set of questions. And maybe eventually some of our young people will figure out how to study the planets around the other stars. To me, that's exciting. That's, that's what the future holds for our young people right now. The Smithsonian has been a fabulous place to do both research and to try and instill in the public an appreciation of what scientists are learning these days.